Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for coming today to uh, this briefing on uh, the multiple benefits of federal housing and energy programs. Uh, we're delighted you could be here. I would also like to welcome new members of Congress and new staff uh, who might be attending one of these briefings for the first time. Um, today's briefing will be uh, sort of a 101, so we're going to encourage you to ask questions. We'll save the questions till after our panel, so that's about an hour for the panel. Um, so I'm, again, very happy to welcome you. I'm Ellen Vaughn with the Environmental and Energy Study Institute, and we are really pleased to present today's briefing with uh, Energy Efficiency for All. And uh, so I would like to turn it over to the senior policy advocate for EFA, we call it, um, who is Khalil Shaid. And uh, Khalil is going to moderate the panel, and we'll, we'll int he'll introduce each of the speakers. And um, uh, so I did want to say just a, a few words um, about Khalil, who's um, amazing. Uh, he is with NRDC, National Resources Defense Council, um, and uh, again, he serves as uh, project uh, manager for EFA and also senior policy advocate for NRDC's Resilient Communities Program. Uh, and he has um, not only uh, experience and background um, on these issues in housing and energy efficiency for all, literally, um, uh, but also educational background in um, sustainable international development, both, both a master's from uh, 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 Brandeis and a PhD, University of Delaware, um, but also has uh, been a community organizer and I think brings just that real authentic experience to why these uh, programs are so important. So I'm just so delighted to uh, hand it over to Khalil. Thank you, Ellen. Um, and thank you, everyone, uh, for coming out. Um, <clears throat> again, uh, my name is Khalil Shaheed, and I am a senior policy advocate uh, with the Resilient Communities Program at the Natural Resources Defense Council, um, where I work with, with the uh, Energy Efficiency for All project with our federal policy team. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, we're very happy, again, today to be working with EESI on what is now our second briefing, and, and we hope to do a number, of more, a, a, a number more in the coming months. Uh, uh, partnering with them. Uh, but today's briefing, uh, we're going to be discussing uh, the multiple benefits of housing and energy programs, thinking of them uh, not as separate sectors, but thinking of them in, un in unison and the complements between affordable housing um, and energy programs. Um, and wh why this is important is because housing and the residential sectors where we live is one of the primary places where people every day intersect with energy and, and, and with our energy policy as end-use consumers um, of energy. Uh, housing and the residential sector um, is also one of the single largest uh, sources of, of greenhouse gas carbon emissions uh, that are fueling, uh, fu uh, fueling uh, climate change. Um, and so addressing uh, the how and the where we live, how we house people, how we give people stable homes is going to be a very uh, key factor in how we address uh, climate change going forward. Um, and more importantly, uh, you know, in the coming months, year, in the election cycle, you're going to be hearing a lot more debate um, about the role of housing and affordable housing and access to housing and what that means for our uh, climate discussion. Um, so that's pretty much it for me. Uh, the easiest part of a panel discussion is being the moderator, uh, where I get to hand it off to, uh, to four uh, expert panelists that are going to both entertain and educate us um, about some key issues in the relationship between affordable housing um, and our nation's uh, energy policy, particularly as it relates to energy efficiency. Um, and we hope that this discussion, again, you'll be able to hearken back to it um, again as, as, as these conversations about the relationship between housing, energy, and climate change continue uh, to grow uh, again uh, in the coming months. Um, yes. Uh, so our first speaker 
uh, is my colleague, uh, Ellen uh, Laurie Hoffman, uh, who uh, is with the National Housing Trust, and, uh, and I should say, this is a reminder, um, I did not uh, give uh, more detail about EFA, Energy Efficiency for All, um, is a national partnership between the Natural Resources Defense Council and the National Housing Trust. Um, Elevate Energy, which is formerly CNT Energy out of Chicago, uh, and the uh, Energy Foundation. Um, and we work in 13 states uh, across the country to increase the share of utility finance energy efficiency, energy efficiency programs uh, going into the affordable multifamily housing sector, which is a very hard to reach uh, uh, sector uh, for uh, energy efficiency services and programs. Um, and so my colleague Ellen uh, works with me on federal policy for EFA. Uh, she's with the uh, National Housing Trust, uh, where she's been uh, since 2014. Uh, and she is the federal policy director uh, at the National Housing Trust. Um, Ellen has been responsible for federal ho housing policy spending, uh, HUD budget, uh, uh, <coughs> Uh, maintaining and approving the low-income housing tax credit, energy efficiency investments, housing finance reform, and fair housing. Uh, she represents the trust before congressional staff, federal officials, and other housing advocates and stakeholders. Uh, prior to joining the trust, Ellen worked for the National Council of State Housing Agencies, um, and she's also been engaged, where she was also engaged on the HUD budget, housing finance reform, HUD rental assistance dem demonstration, uh, the FHA, USDA multifamily programs, uh, and a host of others. Uh, she's promoted a primary, she, she's been promoted to a primary role for state agencies uh, for a Section 8 performance based contract administration program, or PBCA. Uh, with HUD and Congress. Um, she holds a master's in public policy degree from Harvard University's John Kennedy School of Government and a Bachelor of Arts degree in political science from Vassar College. Uh, so I'll turn it over to Ellen. Thank you. Thanks so much, Khalil. Before I start, I'm going to give, give the mic back to the other Ellen. We, we like to have as many Ellens as possible on our panel. Thank you, Ellen. See, we did it just so we could say that. <laughs> now, I wanted to, I, I uh, am remiss in not thanking very uh, deeply uh, uh, Congressman Paul Tonko's office for helping us uh, with this briefing and sponsoring this room. Um, Congressman Tonko has been such a wonderful advocate for weatherization programs and housing programs. So um, thank you so much. And Ellen, back to you. Okay. Thanks, Ellen, and and thank and I'll echo Ellen's thanks to Representative Tonko. We're really delighted to be here today and excited to meet all of you, especially those who are new or newly reassigned. Um, so I am the housing person on the panel, and I'm going to be giving sort of a very quick introduction to federal housing programs, those that um, EFA is specifically focused on, which is rental assistance, project-based rental assistance, and the low-income housing tax credit. First, I'm going to, first, I'm just going to take a minute and talk about the National Housing Trust. So we, as Khalil mentioned, we're one of the four um, national partner organizations that form EFA. Um, but we're also a national nonprofit. We're based here in DC. We're focused on um, preserving existing multifamily affordable housing. So as you can see from our mission statement, we protect, improve, and maintain existing affordable housing for low-income families. We do that through three primary lines of business, policy at the federal, state, and local level, um, real estate development, and lending. And we also have a special focus on energy efficiency within affordable housing because energy is the number one driver of operating costs in housing, and so it has a particularly heavy burden on low-income residents. Okay, so I, I told the other panelists I'm going to be relatively quick. There, this is a lot of information. I'm going to go as slowly and carefully as I can, but also please, I encourage anyone to feel free to follow up with me to have a more in-depth conversation about federal housing policy because it's kind of hard to cover it all in, you know, eight to ten minutes. Um, but I'm going to start with project-based rental assistance. And um, project-based rental assistance is a HUD program. It is appropriated annually by Congress. It's a public-private partnership, and what that means is the properties, the apartments, multifamily housing is privately owned um, by private owners, 
and the federal government provides rental assistance. And it serves over 1.2 million low and very low income households across the country. The average income of those residents is under $13,000 a year. So these are, these are folks without a lot of resources. And over half of the households have at least one family member that's either elderly or disabled. So a lot of people on fixed incomes. Um, Peabury properties are everywhere. They're in urban areas, rural, suburban. I guarantee you that they're in the districts that you represent. Um, and we have lots of data that we'd be happy to share with you about where those properties are specifically and what the population is that's served in, in your state and your district. Um, so I mentioned it's privately owned housing. Um, the way that, rent, that P PBRA works is that low-income residents who are income qualified pay 30% of their income for rent, no more than that. And HUD through pro rental assistance makes up the difference. The rents are tied to market, so this ends up being a big part of the HUD budget. It's a big issue for HUD appropriations every year because the rent levels uh, ebb and flow and generally in the recent years have just gone up and up and up as anyone who's looked for an apartment in the DC area knows. Um, so the rents are tied to market so that the, and the properties are kept as market rate units, but the residents are able to pay no more than 30% of their income. Um, PBRA does require annual appropriations, so every year we make sure that appropriators and members of Congress understand why this commitment is so important. These are long-term contracts that private owners get, uh, sign with the federal government but the contracts are dependent on the federal appropriation. And I will mention just as a side note that we did have a big problem with project-based rental assistance during the shutdown, um, the recent government shutdown where HUD was unable to renew contracts in December, part of December and January. And we, I know there's gonna be a T-HUD subcommittee hearing about that next week. Um, it's something that we're very concerned about and trying to understand what happened there and why there were not adequate appropriations. Obviously, shutdowns are not something that anyone wants to see happen, and it's not normal uh, course of business. But you may have heard about that. There was a lot of press coverage during the shutdown. OK, quickly pivoting to a totally different program, the Low Income Housing Tax Credit. Now, this is also a federal program, but it is through the the Internal Revenue Code. Um, and this is a program that, as opposed to project-based rental assistance, provides assistance in building and preserving or rehabilitating properties. So it's really the number one tool that the federal government provides if you want to build an apartment building or multifamily housing for low-income people. It's almost impossible to put the resources together and to make the numbers work to serve low-income people without the use of the low-income housing tax credit. And at the Trust, we're really focused on how important the credit is as well for preserving. So, and let me just pause for a minute and talk about why is preservation, you're hearing me talk about preservation, and if you don't know a lot about uh, a federally assisted affordable housing, you may wonder what I'm talking about. Um, everyone knows that housing n needs to be improved over time. If you're a homeowner or even if you're a renter, you know after 10 years, things start to fall apart. Um, and after 20 years, even more. Roofs need to be replaced, windows need to be replaced, energy systems need to be upgraded and made more efficient. Um, and so there needs to be per periodic recapitalization of affordable multifamily housing. And that's why the low income housing tax credit is so important for preservation, is it provides a tool to bring in a, a reinvestment in this housing so that it can continue to serve low income people over the long term. Um, so the credit was created as part of the 1986 Tax Reform Act, and since then it's served 2.8, it has financed more than 2.8 affordable house, uh, uh, homes nationwide at about 100,000 per year. They, these properties serve 6.7 million um, households, which includes families, seniors, veterans, people with disabilities. And once again, as with all federally assisted housing, residents don't pay any more than 30% of their income for rent. The housing credit, I'm just going to take a minute and explain how it works. So it's a tax credit program. 
Um, it does provide, there's an allocation of tax credits to every state in the country, um, and it serves all kinds of communities. States have the opportunity to decide where to target their credits, and generally they do in urban as well as rural and suburban communities. The federal government issues, issues the tax credits each year to the states, and it's based on the per capita per capita formula, so depending on how many people are in the state will determine how many housing credits they actually get. And then the states determine their own credit allocations through a competitive process. They have, each state has something called a qualified allocation plan. They do a very intensive public participation process where they uh, work with the public, they accept comments on their plan, so folks have a chance to weigh in and say, this is what we think the state should be using its resources for, these are the populations that need to be served. Um, so it's a flex, it's a very flexible program, and the states have done a terrific job over the years in using it to serve the specific needs of their uh, low-income populations. The trust runs a database called PresCAT. I have the link here, and it will be in all the materials and posted online, which um, if you're interested in the housing credit or you want to see how your state is using it, it's a database which will show the qualified allocation plans of each state and what their priorities are. And you can see through the qualified allocation plan, they, it's, you know, it's a competitive system, so there's points attached to different kinds of housing categories. And then developers come in and have to compete, um, and those with the highest scores get the credits. Um, so that is a really just about the fastest explanation of low-income housing tax credit I think anyone has ever provided. Uh, again, if people have questions, please feel free to follow up with me. I'm going to save the rest of the time for our amazing panelists who are going to talk more specifically about energy efficiency programs. But just to give you the context, these federal programs are important to understand, even if you don't work on housing at all, because in many cases, the energy assistance programs are being provided to people in the federally assisted housing. So, you know, you may need uh, energy efficiency improvements, you may need weatherization assistance in a property that was originally financed with low-income housing tax credits or in which people are being served by project-based rental assistance. So EFA is all about the intersection between housing and energy. Again, the, the, the most important thing to remember is that energy is the number one driver of operating costs in affordable rental housing, and that low-income people are disproportionately burdened by energy costs. And so finding a way to help them both afford their housing and afford their utility bills um, is critically important so that they have the resources they need to be able to access other things in their life like education, health care, job opportunities. So that's it. This is my contact. Please feel free. I look forward to meeting and speaking with all of you, and I will turn it back to Khalil. Well, thank you so much, Ellen. Um, and so Ellen just really talked about you know, both uh, the how and the where uh, through our federal programs, we provide uh, housing assistance and actually access to housing uh, for people. And 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 the, and the outcome of those questions, the how and the where, uh, also uh, has a very uh, deep impact and influences how we provide energy services uh, to those families and those residents uh, in those housing properties. Um, and, what we, and what we've been finding, particularly when we look at the, at the rates of energy burden uh, for low-income families, is that we're not doing an adequate job of providing access to stable and affordable energy. Uh, for many of these families. Uh, and so our next speaker, uh, Eric Bena, is going to come in and talk about one of our uh, key federal programs that actually supports and assists families uh, to be able to uh, reduce their housing costs uh, through the Weatherization Assistance Program, or WAP. Uh, <clears throat> Eric is the Policy and Communications Manager at the National Association for State Community Services Program. Uh, he works with both the Weatherization Assistance Program and Community Services Block Grant Program. Head, heading, handling communications and legislative affairs. He also supports NASCAP's training and technical assistance activities. Eric holds a degree in political science and economics. Um, Eric, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Khalil said, my name is Eric Bain. I'm with NASCASP, and I'm going to talk to you all about the Weatherization Assistance Program today. Um, 
So just really quickly, a little bit about NASCAS. We are the member association for the state directors of the Weatherization Assistance Program and the Community Services Block Grant. You're going to hear a lot about WAP today, but the Community Services Block Grant is also uh, another really important uh, grant that funds a nationwide network of community action agencies that are anti-poverty agencies, and a lot of those also administer the Weatherization Program at the local level. So that's kind of the overlap and connection there. Um, so. The mission of the Weatherization Assistance Program, uh, a lot of times I talk to folks and they are familiar with the concept of weatherization, but they don't realize that we have a nationwide program that has been providing weatherization services for over 40 years. And um, the mission statement of the Weatherization Assistance Program, you can see up there from the enabling legislation back in 1976, uh, it's to reduce energy costs for low-income families, particularly the elderly, people with disabilities, and children, by improving the energy efficiency of their homes and ensuring their health and safety. So um, I think that's a really core and worthy mission, and we really always like to highlight that. Um, the Weather Assistance Program is a federal, state, and local partnership. So we have uh, found a great home at Department of Energy because DOE has the science, the research, uh, the standards behind the program. Uh, the Department of Energy grants the weatherization funds authorized by Congress to state grantees, the state offices. Um, those are our members at NASCASP. So in your particular state, you could find the weatherization assistance program in the state energy office. In a lot of uh, states, it's in the housing office. In Washington State, for example, it's in the Department of Commerce. You're going to hear from Michael from Washington State later in this panel. Um, the state offices really oversee the program, and they ensure quality assurance. They leverage additional funds from utilities and other sources. And the state level is also a point to, to drive innovation in the program. Um, so then the state office contracts with uh, subgrantees, the local weatherization providers. As I mentioned, uh, a lot of those are community action agencies, which are uh, trusted anti-poverty fighting organizations that have been around since LBJ's Great Society. A lot of the local providers are local governments and then also other energy efficiency nonprofits. Um, so the Weatherization Assistance Program is a low-income program. It's serving clients up to 200 percent of poverty. So just giving you um, some context there. And then uh, it's also really important to know that in addition to being nationwide in all 50 states, five U.S. territories, D.C., uh, we're really in every county in the nation. So rural, urban, suburban communities, and also all different housing types, single family, manufactured housing, multifamily. Um, so it's really a robust program. And uh, as you can see from my next slide, there's a great need for weatherization assistance in this country. So this is from the EIA's Residential Energy Consumption Survey, which is done periodically every couple years. Um, and you can see from the stats up here, 25.3 25 .3 million homes uh, reporting energy insecurity, millions of homes unable to use their heating and cooling assistance. Um, I think that it's a really widespread problem, and uh, the Department of Energy's weatherization assistance Weatherization Assistance Program plays a key role um, in addressing this. Um, in addition to these stats, the Department of Energy estimates at least 30 to 40 million uh, households are income eligible for the program, but as you can see, uh, there's, there's some really robust need here. And even up to last week, we had the polar vortex across a lot of the country. This is a headline uh, really underscoring this issue uh, when uh, vulnerable families uh, as a last resort, sometimes have to turn to unsafe heating sources, and this is really uh, where the Weatherization Assistance Program, the Lie Heat Program you're about to hear about from Katrina, um, comes in. So a little bit uh, more about what weatherization services are provided by uh, the Department of Energy's program. Um, this is a very s specific program. It's not one size fits all. So every home gets an energy audit by a trained energy auditor, and that energy auditor determines what measures, um, using the latest building science, will save that client, uh, that home, the most energy and the most money. Um, so everything from insulation to uh, high efficiency energy, uh, light bulbs, air sealing, uh, new HVAC equipment. And the biggest thing to remember with weatherization services is that the Department of Energy requires a savings to investment ratio of one. So everything that's being installed in that home is paying for itself over the life of the measure um, in energy savings. Um, additionally, 
Every home weatherized by the, department, by the weatherization assistance program uh, receives an inspection by a quality control inspector, so 100% of homes. And then at the state level, the state is monitoring an additional 5 to 10% of those homes for another layer of quality assurance. Um, looking at some of the benefits, uh, particularly energy savings benefits, um, the Oak Ridge National Laboratory did a wide-scale evaluation of the program a few years ago, and uh, it really has a lot of energy savings benefits in terms of uh, annual savings. The nationwide average is $283 a year for a household, which maybe doesn't seem like a lot to folks in this room, but to a low-income family, that can be a huge savings. And depending upon where you are in the country and your natural gas prices, things like that, your yearly savings could be double uh, upwards of double that. Um, so a lot of good energy savings benefits there, and then it's really important to note that the non-energy saving, the non-energy benefits, excuse me, are almost as big as, or if not bigger than the energy benefits. Um, and when I say non-energy benefits, those are things like health and safety, some of the more intangible uh, benefits. Thinking about that, uh, there are a lot of health benefits to weatherization. I'm not going to focus too much on this because we're going to hear about a great weatherization plus health model from Michael later in the panel. But inherent in energy efficiency, there are health benefits. Uh, you know, reduced asthma, reduced allergy rates, better physical and mental health, fewer missed days of work. Uh, and that's just inherent in making a home more energy efficient. Um, and then you're going to hear from Michael that this weatherization plus health model is really using the weatherization delivery network to deliver more targeted healthy homes improvements that uh, can really help out some of those vulnerable populations with chronic conditions. Um, I also have to mention the jobs aspect of the program. Um, that evaluation done by Oak Ridge Lab found that 8,500 jobs were supported by weatherization and then there's thousands more uh, indirectly in other industries like vendors, manufacturers, suppliers. Uh, so a lot of small businesses, contractors are supported by this program. You know, there's kind of two models uh, for the local agencies. Some local agencies have their own in-house crew that does the work. Other local agencies contract to their local contractor to do the work. Um, it's important to note that the Weatherization Assistance Program being around since 1976 has really pioneered a lot of the energy efficiency technology that's now standard in the whole residential sector. So the home performance industry, a lot of the techniques, technologies, whether it's a blower door, an infrared camera, a lot of these technologies were piloted um, because of Department of Energy funding and research and then tested through the weatherization assistance program. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the funding for the program. Uh, the Department of Energy funding is really the core source of funding for the program. Um, despite the President's budget zeroing out the program the past two budgets, uh, Congress really recognizes the importance of this program and has uh, provided some increases the past two budget cycles, which is, uh, we are very appreciative of. Um, right now for FY 2019, the funding's at $257 million. That's uh, an increase over, uh, two, over 2018 of about $6 million. And um, this, right now, the program is getting back to historical levels of funding. Um, it had been uh, you know, cut in, in recent years, and so um, we're really just uh, approaching kind of historical funding levels where we can have a really robust program. Um, Additionally, of the, of the appropriation, there's also $3 million reserved for headquarters training and technical assistance, um, which that allows the Department of Energy to uh, do training and to uh, conduct research to improve the program and identify opportunities for innovation. Um, in, you can see in this graphic, there are, uh, in addition to the DOE funding, there are two other sources of funding. There is a lot of LIHEAP funding that goes into the weatherization program, and then there's some other funding as well, some leverage funds. So I won't talk too much about LIHEAP because Katrina is going to give you some great uh, information about it, but the thing to know is that the LIHEAP program, Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program, is administered by Department of Health and Human Services, and it really works hand in hand in a strategic partnership with the Department of Energy's Weatherization Assistance Program. States can transfer up to 15% of their LIHEAP allocation to their WAP program, so um, they can use that LIHEAP funding to 
um, make energy efficiency investments. And they can actually go up to 25% if they get a good cause waiver approved by HHS. So states are really able to uh, mix those funds and, and to the best of their state's needs, uh, which I think is really important that, that WAP and LIHEAP are really two sides of the same coin. Um, looking at that last bucket of funding, the other funds or the leverage funds, these are your non-federal funds. Um, there is a big utility investment in the program, and, and so at the state level and sometimes at the local level, uh, the weatherization program can leverage in funds from utilities. Uh, in 2017, from uh, our report with our members, uh, the, our state members, the about 29 states leveraged close to uh, $255 million from utilities and other non-federal sources, so that really brings in some flexible funding to maximize the impact of the program. Um, there's maybe about a dozen states that at the state level, uh, from either from the state budget or from a tax or something like that, they're able to put state funding into the weatherization program and, and maximize that. And then in some cases, there's other non-federal funds from foundations or uh, something that folks are pursuing recently is healthcare dollars because of some of those health uh, uh, benefits. In North Carolina, there's a really great partnership between uh, the weatherization program and Blue Cross Blue Shield and really doing some of that um, healthy homes work. Um, and then this graphic here, I know I'm running out of time, but uh, I just wanted to emphasize that the success of the weatherization assistance program lies in the cooperation and partnership between entities at the federal, state, local level, um, utilities, government, you know, nonprofits, all working together to uh, ensure that the funding is adequate and that the services are being provided for uh, our vulnerable low-income clients because that's really why this program is around and that's why everyone in the program does what they do. It's a really unique and special po program in the sense that not a lot of programs go into people's homes and make a tangible difference in their lives. And I think that um, it's a really admirable and uh, a, a program that uh, you and your bosses could take another look at and uh, going into this appropriation cycle. Um, definitely take a uh, note of my contact information. I'd be happy to come in, meet with your office, talk to your Energy LA. Um, connect you up to the state weatherization director for your state to learn more about how the programs run in your state. Um, additionally, just keep an eye out. Uh, generally every year, Representative Tonko and Representative McKinley on the House side will do an appropriations letter and then uh, Senator Reid and Senator Collins on the Senate side, uh, always looking to get more offices to sign on to those and show support for this program. And then, uh, yeah, definitely I'm going to be here afterwards. Come up. We happy to answer any questions about how the program works in your state. Thanks. Thank you, Eric. Um, th that was a brilliant overview of not only the, the weatherization assistance program and the work that it's done over the last 40 years of, of being the leader through that public investment uh, in energy efficiency services, being a leader and actually uh, creating the, the technology, the techniques, and really some of the innovative financing for how you actually get uh, energy uh, services, particularly to the uh, low-income housing sector. Um, and, and when Eric talked about, you know, a lot of those non-energy benefits, those, those ancillary benefits, be they jobs, health, I think it really showed the centrality of housing and residential housing to any myriad of issues. And if you can stabilize people in their homes, you know, the multiple benefits for jobs, economic development, health, education, all spew from one having a stable roof um, over your head. Um, and so with that, uh, we're going to go into um, our next speaker, uh, Katrina Metzler. Um, she has dedicated her career uh, to, to community service and advocating for the most in need. Uh, she has a wide range of experience in the field of energy, education, and poverty fighting programs spanning more than 20 years. As an advocate at local, state, and now federal level, she has supported legislation for programs such as LAHEAP, WAP, CSBG, uh, SE, and SEP. And she's going to tell us what all those alphabets mean, I promise you. Uh, previously, <laughs> previously uh, Katrina was the executive director for Family, Adult, and Children First Council at, at Fairfield County, Ohio. A, a county organization that supported families through grant funds for family mental health services, childhood injury prevention, 
Early Start, and more. She also has held positions as Energy Pol Policy Analyst, State Services Director, Energy Services Director for the National Association of State Community Services Program, or NASCAP. Um, prior to her work in Washington, D.C., she was employed by the state of Ohio, where she was section supervisor for weatherization, managing one of the largest weatherization programs in the country. Mrs. Metzler was appointed to the State Energy Advisory Board in 2013, serving the Assistant Secretary of Energy, where she provided critical assistance to improve access to services and program delivering for, for the people of Ohio. Let's welcome Katrina. Thank you so much, Khalil. I am really second guessing following people like Ellen and Eric, who are so polished and so, uh, you know, so spiffy. I'm going to do my very best, um, but I tend to be a little bit more homespun. So um, I will, I can promise that I will be informative and hopefully you'll enjoy the presentation, but I cannot promise that I'm that slick. Um, to start off, let's get to my slide. Uh, I'm Katrina Metzler, National Energy and Utility Affordability Coalition. You got another N-word group that you can uh, write down, try and remember that acronym for. We are primarily associated at the federal level with um, advocating for the Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program. As Eric said, LIHEAP is the primary federal funding source for energy affordability, and it helps families meet their immediate home heating and cooling needs. Um, there are consequences, you know, so what? So what do we do that? What difference does it make? Um, I think as we move through the presentation, hopefully it'll be clear to you that there are consequences for families, for communities, um, and also there are humanitarian consequences to letting people remain um, in intemperate homes. So LIHEAP, what is that? It is a block grant, and it was established in 1981. When I look out over the crowd, probably there are a few of us in the room who were alive at that time. Do you guys remember who was president in 1981? Where, where are the folks who are over 40 with me? <laughs> Yay! It was Ronald Reagan. So this is a Reagan-era program. Uh, um, we enjoy bipartisan support on the Hill, and we're trying to keep that going. Um, but it was created in 1981 during a, an energy crunch. Like the other programs that you've heard from, Congress appropriates funds annually. This might be, um, you might already know all this, but that differs from something called an entitlement program. So we're not an entitlement program. So basically, our funds don't increase as the need increases. We are appropriated a set amount of funding, and when we run out, even if the line is around the block, for our services, we can no longer provide any more services when the money is gone. So right now that appropriation is at $3.69 billion for FY19. That represents a modest increase um, over the previous year, which we were very grateful for. And uh, honestly, we didn't really expect it in the current environment, but we're, we're really grateful. Um, it would be nice to say that we could help a whole lot more people with that funding, but actually, um, as fuel prices go up and our funding stays relatively flat, we can serve fewer households. So um, just so you know, we did serve nearly 6 million households in, two, in 2017, and I'll talk to you a little bit about who those folks are um, and help you to hopefully paint a portrait of the LIHEAP customer throughout my presentation. We've thrown around terms today like energy burden, and I don't know if you really know what that means. Um, those of us in energy circles are really familiar with that term, but I have found that when I say those words outside of energy circles, they're not always even familiar with what, what I'm talking about. So it's really basic. It is just the percentage of household income that you spend on your energy bills. And so I have a couple of examples to demonstrate for you what effect that has on low-income houses. So the first example is a household with $5,000 a month income and $250 a month in energy costs. Does that seem reasonable to everyone in the room? A middle-class family, very typical. That means their energy burden is 5%. If you take that same bill, $250 for utilities a month, and you apply it to a household where they have a fixed income of only $1,667 per month, then your energy burden is three times higher at 15%. That's the energy burden that we're working on. We, we are trying to make energy more affordable for folks at the lowest levels of income. There's a reason I picked 1667, and that is because that is the average income for a family who is served by LIHEAP. 
So what do we do about it? Um, through LIHEAP, we can do a, a couple of things. This is a, a block grant, so it can be very flexible. You can use it to, um, to take a look at your state, find out what resources you already have, um, look at your climate, look at your housing stock, the needs of your specific population within your state, and then design a program that can meet the needs that you have in your state. Um, the first two are what most people associate with LIHEAP as being, they're basically help paying your utility bill. So we give you some money, we help you to pay your utility bill because it's not affordable to you otherwise. The last two are things that people know less about. We actually are um, very good partners with the Department of Energy Weatherization Program and in 48 states we support energy affordability by installing those energy efficiency measures in houses. So basically if you get a LIHEAP if you get help from LIHEAP assistance, cash assistance, we can follow that up with weatherization. And that helps you to make, uh, helps make your bill more affordable the next year. Maybe you need less of a handout and we can help more people that way with the crisis assistance. We also provide services that reduce the need for energy assistance and provide education. So we can go out into homes and educate them on the best ways um, to make energy more affordable in their own house. So how can I save, how can I save energy first? So um, those of you who work in an office in this room, which I, I'm going to assume is most of you, um, how might you connect with our program? This was typically how I connected with legislators when I ran the LIHEAP and the weatherization programs at the state level. Um, let's say there's a polar vortex. Remember that? Just, I mean, I know it's beautiful out today, but we did have temperatures that were 50 or 60 degrees lower than what we have outside today just a couple of weeks ago. During that time, if there's someone who is homebound, someone who is a shut-in, elderly, uh, maybe no family, no resources, and they don't know who to turn to because their furnace has stopped working. They know they don't have the resources to repair it or to replace it themselves, and they don't have anybody, that, they don't know who to call, they don't know who to, to contact. Sometimes your offices end up getting those phone calls. So they will call you and say, I need help. What programs are in my area? What are you going to do to help me? LIHEAP should be your first call in those situations. We are one of the few programs that can go in and repair those HVAC and cooling systems and also provide new ones for eligible customers. So back in my days at the state of Ohio when I was a weatherization LIHEAP director, these were the calls that I would get from the legislators. They were the, they were the ones picking up the phone. The staffers were calling me saying, I've got a constituent who has this issue. How can you help them? We just completed a survey and we got a lot of data that I decided not to bore you with today, but I did want to provide you the outcome of that data. So, you know, we spent a lot of money on this survey and I thought, you know, if we're going to pay for it, the worst thing we can do is sit it up on a shelf and never look at it. And that's what happens sometimes to data. So we developed a social media education campaign using the most powerful and impactful statistics that came from that data. So I'm going to scroll through those pretty quickly and let you see what some of the information that we learned about our customers was. So this first one is just an introduction to what LIHEAP is. This is who we are, this is what those acronym, this is what the, le the letters L-I-H-E-A-P stand for, and this is what we do. We help our, our neighbors stay safe and warm in their homes. This next one is something that makes you think. So, one in three households helped by LIHEAP has at least a, one child younger than age 18. And now I want you to consider, when they go home at night and have to do their homework, and they have no electricity, they're doing their homework in the dark. So LIHEAP is one of the programs that helps keep children from having to do their homework in the dark. This is not just a program, it is about people. And these are the people who we help. Nine out of 10 households helped by LIHEAP has at least one elderly person, a child, or a person with a disability in the home. That's what we're tasked to do by statute. So by statute, we need to target those most in need. And we are doing exactly that. Nine out of 10 people are exactly who we're supposed to be helping. Four out of five households helped by LIHEAP has an annual income below $20,000. This is an interesting slide. We had a big conversation at my level about whether we put in an annual income or if we break that down into monthly income. I don't know if you realize this, but amongst the low income population, the people who are eligible for LIHEAP, they talk about income as in 
monthly expenses, monthly, I'm getting a check. What's my monthly income? What are my monthly expenses? Can I make it through this month? Or am I going to have too much month at the end of my money? However, those of us in this room probably have an annual salary. We're not targeting the people who are eligible for LIHEAP with this social media campaign. We're targeting you guys. So if you think about income as an annual thing, then we want you to think about um, their income as an annual number too. One out of three households helped by LIHEAP went without food for at least one day in the past year. And these are people who received LIHEAP and they still reported that they went without food at least one day in the past year. I don't miss very many meals. And if I do, my stomach lets me know. But it's really hard for me to consider that someone is making choices, not between Starbucks and whether I brew a pot of coffee at home. They're making choices like, do I buy my medicine or do I pay my utility bill? Do I buy food or do I heat my home? Which one is it going to be? Three out of 10 households uh, receiving LIHEAP used their kitchen stove or oven to provide heat. This was one of the very specific, you know, detailed questions that we ask folks. It's not a broad statistic, it's a specific statistic because I want you to think about the impact uh, and the consequences, the health and safety consequences of this practice. So what would be wrong with opening up your oven door and turning it on to 400 or broil and heating your home? It's a fire hazard, of course, and it's a CO hazard. And if you have little children, it's, it's a hazard. But desperate people resort to desperate measures. And this is one of the examples of that desperation. I think it paints a very clear picture of what a desperate person would do in this situation. Um, NUAC is tasked with educating you all, the general public, about these types of issues. So we are going to be in your neighborhood on February the 28th. That is called LIHEAP Action Day, and people fly in from all over the country. Um, we come in to thank you if you support our program, and we come in to make sure that you know what LIHEAP stands for and why it's important. We have nonprofits. Um, we even have some customers who come in with their stories. So. Uh, you might have already been contacted by us to set up a meeting, and I look forward to talking to you guys all again very soon when everyone is uh, here later this month. Some examples of how we promote LIHEAP at the very local level. We provided these coloring sheets that you see um, in the middle of the board uh, to our local nonprofit providers, and it just said, you know, draw a picture of your house. So the children colored pictures of their houses. And in some cases, they sent those to your offices with little thank you notes. Um, and in other cases, oh, God, wrap up. OK. Um, and in other cases, they put them on a bulletin board and educated their community with those. On, the, on my left, your right-hand side, are postcards. So we also had a postcard project where people who received LIHEAP, they would write a little thank you card, or they would write a card about uh, how it had helped them, and then they mail those all to your DC offices. So if you see postcards like this in your mailbox, it's because someone was really helped by this program and cared enough to sit down and take five minutes to say thank you for supporting it. Um, so who we help? The elderly, veterans, the disabled. And if you squint and look really hard at the person on this side of the screen, that's actually me. Um, and my two kids, who are moderately behaving in this photo. I am a customer who was helped by LIHEAP. Um, anybody can have a really bad year or two. It could be a health crisis, or it can be divorce, or um, I mean, there's any number of things that can happen to any of us and put us in a situation where we need this kind of help. And you know, in my case, it was all of those things, <laughs> divorce, health crisis, you know, loss of job, all in the same year. Um, when we need that help, it's nice to know that there's a safety net there to catch us, and LIHEAP is such an important part of that safety net. This, is, um, <laughs> this slide is in every presentation that I do. It's actually a picture of a thank you note from a child in Ohio um, that's hanging on the wall of my office. It's traveled with me around to all my different jobs, and I know it's probably hard to read it, but it says, thanks for keeping us warm in the winter. I'm thankful for everything you're doing for us. We would be cold. So on days when I have a really terrible day and I feel very overwhelmed by all the things, the fires I have to put out and the things that I have to do, this reminds me that what we do matters to the people who are being helped by LIHEAP. So 
with that, I will turn it over to the next speaker. Um, thank you, Katrina. <laughs> That's really amazing. Um, and and you, you can see, uh, you know, the great work that the LAHI program is doing, um, and it's not enough uh, to meet the needs. And so, you know, we still need more support uh, for, for programs like WAHEAP, uh, WAHEAP, like LAHEAP and the Weatherization Assistance Program. Um, and, and, and remember that, that number, uh, uh, 1667. Uh, you know, and think about the many people who are at 1667, maybe some slightly above, many others actually below. And so when we're thinking about crafting policy, when we're thinking about, you know, how these things impact people, think about those people who are at 1667 and what this means for them. Uh, it's just so important. Uh, thank you. Um, and, and, and Michael, I'm sorry, but you have to follow that. Um, <laughs> so um, but I'm sure you'll do fine. Um, our next speaker. Uh, <laughs> is Michael Furs, uh, and, and he uh, has been with, uh, he, he joined the uh, Department of Commerce uh, back in uh, 2014 as an assistant director for the Energy Division, which includes policy, initiatives, energy emergency management, and the, and the weatherization program. Michael joined the Weatherization Network in 2009, drawn by the convergence of social justice and environmental sustainability uh, to that cause. After working for five years in New Mexico's Energy Smart program, he transitioned to Washington's weatherization program in 2014 and has been actively involved in the Weatherization Network's Weatherization Advisory Committee. Michael has earned a master's degree in community and regional planning from the University of New Mexico. Let's welcome Michael. Thanks for having me here. Thanks for that introduction and for laying the foundation for me to talk about how in Washington State we ground um, what are national programs that uh, reach into people's lives and, and help them out. The Department of Commerce is Washington's um, Swiss Army knife for communities. We do economic development and community development work and if a community has a challenge we have a program or a tool or a technical assistance that can help them out. In a lot of cases, that technical assistance uh, is around strengthening communities, and what that means is strengthening families. And the Weatherization Plus Health program that we administer is, is just one of those. I'd like for you to bring into your mind one of your stereotypes of the Pacific Northwest. It's gray, it's cold, it's rainy. And I want to tell you about the Finkbonner family. It's a home uh, that we helped through the Weatherization Plus Health program. Uh, the husband works in the commercial fishing industry on the Lummi Nation, and he's fortunate enough to be able to afford a three-bedroom family, a three-bedroom house for his family. It's built in 1930. It's about 1,400 square feet. On a typical cold day, not like today when they're going to get 12 inches of snow, it's cool, it's drafty, it's gray and overcast. It feels really uh, claustrophobic when you're inside. And in that home, there's plumbing leaks in the bathroom, it's really damp in the basement. Fire's going on a wood stove, and it's not properly ventilating, so you get that taste of wood smoke when you walk around the house. It's cold and it's drafty. There's no insulation, and there are leaks in the ventilation system that they do have. There are 11 people living in this home. One of the seniors has COPD, and one of the children has a respiratory condition. And the quote that they offered us um, when they were telling us their stories, before our home was weatherized, it was very drafty and cold. The electric bills were nearly $700 a month in the winter, and they couldn't afford the repairs to fix their house. And so we collaborated a local community action agency, the Opportunity Council, which is in the northwest part of Washington. They worked with uh, tribal authorities uh, using uh, some of their funds and some of our weatherization dollars to go in and do the assessment that Eric talked about, figure out what they could do in that house through the weatherization program, kind of the basic measures there to look at insulation, uh, to add a ductless heat pump, to install um, air sealing measures and to make the house tighter. And then they used our weatherization plus health measures to fix the moisture problems, uh, to remove old moldy carpet, and uh, made, do a major roof repair and make the upgrades that allowed the family to live more comfortably in that space. What they said after the work was over was that they felt much cozier in their home. They no longer have a heat source that isn't a fire danger. The roof, the bathrooms, and the basement are free of water leaks. 
They don't get colds as often, and they feel much healthier. And their electric bills are about half of what they were paying before. And given the numbers that Katrina showed, you can get a sense of what um, that type of reduction in energy burden does for a family uh, that's working to make ends meet. I also want to tell you about the Osborne family. They're from Snohomish County, which uh, has given us Boeing and uh, the airplane that flew me out here a couple of days ago. And um, the Osbournes bought a house that was built in 1901, a two-bedroom, single-family home for their expanding household. Uh, the mother in that household, uh, well, there's a young child, and she was pregnant. And I just want to talk about the difference pre-weatherization plus health and post-weatherization plus health to give you a sense of what the effect can be. Um, during her first pregnancy, she had three to four visits uh, to urgent care to take care of her asthma. She was constantly sick, and her husband had to stay home from work in order to take care of her. So again, thinking back to the number of 1666, um, what the effect of staying home from work does to the, um, the monthly finances of that family. And so we were able to partner with the Snohomish County, the local government, that's our CAP agency, and uh, they provided a whole suite of measures and education to go along with the measures that we install in the home. Uh, at, as a result, in her second pregnancy, the, no urgent care, not sick, uh, and the husband did not have to take off time of work. So really a significant transition from one experience to the other. Really interesting thing that the weatherization program does when it goes into a home is provide education. And in the Weatherization Plus Health program, when we get into a really innovative space, we can do it around the specific health conditions of that family. And what we found was that in this case, uh, the household really learned the importance of having a vacuum cleaner with a HEPA filter, the really fine particulates getting out of the air that they're breathing. And using that on a more regular basis helped them uh, stay healthier. Those are just an example of the 300 folks that we've helped in Washington State with our Weatherization Plus Health pilot program. And now I'll bore you with the details of the program design. <laughs> and as some of you may know, uh, I think Eric alluded to this, there's the uh, energy benefits and the non-energy benefits. And the recent research is showing that a lot of these non-energy benefits, we can just go ahead and call, hel uh, call health benefits because that's what they really are. And what we're looking to do is to try and take advantage of those health benefits to build on the energy efficiency savings that the program already offers. And it's tricky. Um, Quantifying these is a little bit more difficult than measuring kilowatt hours saved uh, and bill reductions, uh, but it's really important to do that. Washington State has been doing this work in weatherization plus health for a while. The Opportunity Council that I mentioned previously has been a leader in this uh, since the late 90s. King County Housing Authority uh, outside of Seattle uh, has also been doing some of this work. And uh, we were able to elevate it to the national level working with NASCASP back during the Recovery Act. The two pilot programs that I mentioned really helped uh, educate legislators. In 2015, we had a, legislature, a legislator who was our champion that took the state funding that we have for the weatherization program and expanded eligible uses to allow us to go more directly after weatherization plus health measures. They gave us additional funding uh, to do that work. The program typically spends about 20, uh, million, 20 to $25 million a year from five funding sources, um, and we got five additional dollars to try this weatherization plus health pilot. Uh, the graphic on the left shows two phases of that. One is kind of a basic approach to give everybody the opportunity to do more measures and do different measures. And uh, the one in the middle there um, really tried to go after a more collaborative approach with community health centers to really um, provide a more holistic uh, connection to those communities. And really the idea is synthesis, to take the weatherization program, um, those services along with health services and social services, and to bring them to bear at the families that need them the most. Um, and so it's a little bit different than what we've been doing previously, so it's taken some time to get the collaboration right, to develop specific approaches for specific communities uh, that allow us to bring um, uh, the right households in and get them the right suite of services. And then again, it's a longer term project to identify and track uh, long-term health benefits of this program. Um, but again, this is the right work to do to be able to demonstrate those non-energy slash health benefits. This is a difficult to read slide that shows the comparison of the basic weatherization measures that are on the bottom that our program builds off of and some of the, um, the new measures that we go after in weatherization plus health. Um, th think of things that reduce moisture, that reduce slips, trips, and falls, that can be customized and targeted for folks that have got COPD or asthma. And really, we're just giving people a suite to pick and choose uh, the exact set of services that the household needs. 
And this is kind of how we stack the services. There's the traditional weatherization approach. We're providing at least basic education, both about energy use and about health uh, benefits. When we're partnering with community health workers, we can tailor that to specific households and specific individuals. Uh, and then we're providing folks tools so they continue to live healthier in their, um, their, their home that's received services. Eric mentioned leveraging, and this slide is just to give you a sense of how complicated it is to bring different funding sources, each with slightly different eligibility requirements, uh, to bear to provide these services. Um, as you heard from Katrina and Eric, weatherization and LIHEAP generally play really nicely together. Um, we also get funding from utilities, we get funding from the Bonneville Power Administration, uh, we get m money from the state, and they each do something slightly different. Uh, and we had to use all of the flexibility that we had uh, in order to, uh, to get houses the, the right types of services. Good sign, initial results are promising. Um, what we found is that through the education process and through the immediate effects that people are seeing uh, when we do the health upgrades, that they're, um, that they're taking action. Folks are seeing improvement in their uh, ability to control the respiration. And uh, what was really uh, heartening to me is that 70% of the participants uh, talked about reporting higher quality of life. So it's nice to know that we're, we're really delivering uh, for the, the customers that, uh, that we're seeing. 43 of those customers uh, had fewer doctor's visits, um, meaning that they could go to work and had uh, additional money in their, in their pocket to make their ends meet by the end of the month. So as I said, this is a pilot program, and we tried to develop an approach that would stack on the work that we've been doing for 40 plus years in the weatherization program to give more people a chance to do different measures and try to get that work done uh, correctly in a home. It takes a little bit of time to learn how to do something new. Um, and then we call that the Weatherization Plus Health 1.0. And then we had five community action agencies that kind of stepped into the 2.0 Weatherization Plus Health space. And that's trying to develop an innovative partnership where you're working with uh, community health workers to identify specific families, customize your education, and the measures that they receive to treat their specific illness more directly. And we think that while it's a lot harder to do that work, because you're bringing two completely different universes together, uh, that's where we're going to be able to find significant benefits, in addition to just uh, opening up the suite of measures to uh, folks across the state. Big question. Every state's different. Can you do this in your state or in your district? And the answer is uh, yes, if um, you have the, the, the right framework, the right strategic vision, and you have uh, folks that are willing to try something new. Um, it's that drive uh, to, to do something different, to treat people in a different way that sparked interest uh, in the Northwest uh, to do this weatherization plus health work. We also benefit by having pioneers that were ready to step forward and try and, and make this work on the ground to deliver the benefit. And we've had leadership at all levels. It's been helpful to have support from the governor's office, from uh, legislators and representatives to do this work, and then from community leaders uh, through the CAP agency that want to, again, try something new. Flexible funding, uh, I think, is the real key. If I didn't state it explicitly, um, what makes this program work is the state capital dollars that we've got. That's what enabled us to do the pilot program. What we're working on now is collaborating with the LIHEAP office to expand the use of those funds to more directly go after uh, weatherization plus health measures. We continue to receive funding for weatherization plus health from the state of Washington. Appreciate that. We'll see what else we can do with LIHEAP funding. And what we'll be doing in the next two years is expanding the number of local agencies that are delivering that weatherization 1.0 level of service, uh, and then trying to find those partners who have uh, strong community health programs in their communities that are willing to take on that weatherization 2.0 approach. Here's a list of references uh, that'll be available in the uh, slide deck. Thank you very much. Thanks, Michael. That was, that was a really great job following that up. Um, you didn't blink at all. Uh, <laughs> um, well, 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 thank you. Um, I mean, that, that was, I think, you know, you know just, again, a, a really great overview of how, again, stabilizing housing can provide so many other benefits. And again, starting with an intervention in energy costs and, 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 the, and the energy matrix uh, you know, within the home and, and what the um, other benefits 
you know, then can bring. Um, and so now with the time that we have left, we really want to open it up uh, to you and the audience. I'm sure that there are many questions. Uh, the one thing that I do ask is that you can tell us who you are and who you're working with, whether it's here on the Hill or one of our partner organizations um, that you're here representing. Um, so please, if you can just, when you stand, tell us who you are and who you're working with so we can keep a good counting. Uh, yes. So the, the short answer to how it works is it's a challenge, right? So HIPAA, which is in, um, in place for a reason, really complicates the nature of the relationship between the, the community health workers and the weatherization assistance program, and it, it, it led to kind of fits and starts in this process. Uh, we've been working with Washington State University's energy program to track uh, the savings in terms, in the, uh, track the medical savings over time. And I think the part of the problem is that we're sort of new in this process, that it takes time for those cost savings to ripple out. So we're working through the challenges of HIPAA compliance with families, uh, with the community health workers, and trying to study that over the long term. But the short term answer is that we're waiting for that data to come in and trying to find ways to access it. Hi, um, my name is Chloe Greenwood. I'm with the National Council of State Housing Agencies. Um, Ellen's predecessor. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering, question for Katrina, I was wondering how is LIHEAP, similarly to how the low-income housing tax credits are, you know, they go by state, state, um, how is LIHEAP allocated? Is it like really warm climates, really cold climates? Is it like based on population size? How is that determined? Yeah, there's a formula that's used to allocate funding from the federal level to the state level, and it takes into account the number of eligible folks who are in that particular state climate. Um, so it's, it's, it's renewed every year. They look at the most recent data that they have on all of those many factors. They put that together into a big pot, mix it up, and distribute funding to the states based on that. Generally, you'll see more funding go to the northeast, where, um, where it's colder, and less funding go to the south. Um, but it, the, the formula, I could sit here and talk for probably six hours on it. So, um, mm -hmm. But there's, there's a new formula. So as we grow in funding, more money is funneled to the southern states where there's a really, a really huge need. So for example, Mississippi Delta is the poorest area of our country. Um, they get more money when we have higher funding levels for LIHEAP. I'll just quickly echo that with weatherization. It's almost exactly the same way on the weatherization side. The formula is dependent upon climate, you know, low-income population, and then it's the same way that once the appropriation reaches a higher level, there's a trigger that um, alters the formula slightly to give those warm weather climate states more, um, more funding. And, I, I, and something to note about weatherization and LIHEAP is they kind of have this reputation as heating programs, cold weather programs, but they both provide a lot of help on the cooling side as well. And some of those uh, electric savings are even higher in the southeast and in the warm weather climate. So um, there's, there's a lot of savings to be had in the cooling baseload as well. And the question is for any of you, and that is if you could speculate on how climate change may be affecting these specific programs or perhaps new programs. Um, I'll, I'll touch on this a little bit. Um, I think that when you think about climate change, what comes to mind first for me is um, resiliency and that when uh, our climate is changing. It's the vulnerable families served by these programs that stand the most to lose, that are most at risk from the negative impacts of climate change. And so when you talk about a severe weather event like a hurricane or a snowstorm or a heat wave, uh, it's probably a WAP client home, a, an inefficient home that's putting the most stress on the power grid, that's putting the most um, stress on the reliability of the power grid. So I think that Weatherization, ha in, at least, has a potential to um, serve, serve a real role in um, terms of resiliency and reliability when you're thinking about climate change. I agree with everything that Eric said, and I will add that the populations who are served by our programs 
are living in the worst housing stock in our country. So when you think about leaky windows and uh, leaky homes, big drafty houses, um, multifamily housing, that's where they're living and they are served, they're served better by our programs and also, um, you know, they have, I think, I think what you said was they have the most to lose. They have the most to lose by, um, by living in that particular housing stock and they're the most in need. Thank you. <laughs> what I would add are kind of two thoughts. One is um, thinking about the fires that we've had in the Pacific Northwest uh, and leaky homes and folks with asthma, right? I mean, you, normal recommendations is to stay, uh, stay indoors. Um, and even if, if the house can't protect you, then your health is compromised that much more. So that's something to think about. The other thing that I'm seeing, in, in addition to managing the weatherization program, I also um, help lead the team that is our, part of our state energy office. And so the, there's a conversation that's happening that's different as a result of climate change where more environmental justice stakeholders are coming to the table and wanting to better understand how the programs work and how they can deliver benefits to their communities. And so what that means is that the dialogue's not over and we'll be learning more about how to better do that in the coming years. Oh, thanks. I was just going to add very briefly from the um, housing assistance side of things, just that properties with federal either rental assistance or low-income housing tax credits have to be held to very high standards for construction and renovation. Um, so they would tend to be, we, for example, we were looking at after the hurricane in Florida a year or so ago, there were some properties with low-income housing tax credits that were the only properties standing in an area where everything else was devastated. So because they have federal assistance, they're held to a high construction and rehab standard. That doesn't mean that they don't need to really focus on resilience and all of the things that have previously been said. But when we've seen so many people lose their homes or be low-income people be disproportionately impacted by climate change, uh, you know, <coughs> catastrophic events, it just points to the need for the federal government to invest in affordable housing because it does give them good quality housing. And one thing I didn't mention, which I regret in my presentation, is that federal government only provides enough rental assistance for one in four Americans that are eligible for it. So three quarters of the low income people who could qualify, whether it's project based assistance or vouchers, which I didn't talk about today, but it's another huge program, 75% um, of those people are not being served. And then when you have catastrophic weather events because of climate change, those people are m most directly going to be impacted because they're not in housing that's been held to this higher standard. Yeah. Um, here. And then. Um, Thomas from Senator Sanders' office. I guess my question is just, um, first of all, thank you for the awesome panel, but uh, my question is, you know, what approaches have you found effective dealing with rural versus urban populations? I guess this is for all of you um, and kind of how, what have you learned from kind of dealing with this, diff, uh, this issue in uh, rural versus urban population? Um, from a weatherization perspective, um, the, there are some challenges in rural areas in the sense of, you know, um, if the homes you're working on are spread out, there's logistical issues with that. Um, I think that there's some data that would show you that rural homes tend to, to have some higher instances of substandard housing and, and lower housing quality. Um, so I think that those are challenges in the rural space, but uh, the weatherization assistance program, as I said, is in every county in the nation, and they do a good chunk of, uh, of rural housing, and I, I would say that in a lot of states, it's a majority rural program. You could, you could make that um, assumption in a lot of states. Mm -hmm. I think this is an ongoing conversation that we're having with LIHEAP. Uh, a number of our clients are homebound or cannot leave their homes to come out and apply. So do we offer an online application? How's that going to be for those who, have, um, who are visually impaired? How do we offer this program and make sure that it's reaching those who are most in need? Um, what we have found is that the best way to do that is not to expect those folks to come to you, but to bring the application and bring the services to them. So you'll see local providers go out into the community to go to the senior center, to go to the Head Start centers, to go to the places where the customers are so that um, we're able to reach them on their turf uh, rather than forcing them to come to an office and stand in line and make an appointment. Um, the traditional way that you think about uh, performing social services.
I'll just add on, and I think I mentioned this on the housing side, so there's project-based rental assistance in every kind of community and quite a bit in rural areas. Um, there's also USDA rental assistance programs and housing programs, which I didn't touch on today, but happy to help anyone who wants more information about those programs. A lot of times in rural areas we find that the subsidized rental housing is the only rental housing that's available. So that's why preserving it is so important, because if you lose you know, that individual affordable property, there will literally be no place else for those folks to go. And then just uh, to reiterate again on the low income housing tax credit program, because it is allocated by the states, um, the states are going to be focused on the state housing finance agencies that allocate the, the credit focus on what the needs are. So, for example, in Vermont, I know they do a great job of evaluating the rural needs um, of their constituents and make sure that the housing is targeted towards that. And that's going to vary state to state. But there is definitely a focus on using the housing credit in rural areas to meet those housing needs where it's appropriate. Hi, Noreen Beatley. I'm with the International Center for uh, Appropriate and Sustainable Technology. I always mm -hmm. have to remember ICAS. Um, and I have two questions, actually. One is, how much, what's the percentage of multifamily housing that are helped by these programs versus single family? And then the second one, especially in relation to multifamily, Michael, your program in Washington State is great, um, but how do you deal or have you had to deal with um, the split incentive that the health pro uh, benefits generally are um, attributed to the residents versus the um, property owners, because the property owners do get benefit from the energy savings, as, as Eric said, it's a dollar for dollar, but if you add the health in, there's no benefit to the property owner. So I think that the approach that we're taking to the split incentive with regard to the energy efficiency, to the weatherization plus health program is <clears throat> similar to the one that the regular weatherization program would take. It's outreach education, and we're relying on the community action agency to know their community and to work with, uh, in the case of multifamily properties, landlords to bring them into the program, you know, help sell them on the benefits of the program and move forward. Where the Weatherization Plus Health program is in terms of its pilot phase, um, I don't know the split off the top of my head, but my sense is that the multifamily properties would be a significantly uh, a small portion of the work that's going on there. Um, and so it's something that we'll have to take on more directly as we expand the program in the next couple of years. Uh, so I think more to come is the, the short answer for that question. Um, maybe in follow-up to that, my name's Whit Faulkner. I work for the JPB Foundation. Um, when you're doing your long-term planning, these organizations and the work that you're doing, you've already sort of alluded to kind of a moving target, and we're already at only one and four uh, being able to be served. What's what's the, the you know even in round numbers as you have got intense weather shortening building life cycle, all you know none of us are getting any younger uh, <laughs> by the day. Buildings you know are aging at a certain like what is the, how do you make your long term plans and what does that what does that look like uh, in terms of the demographic that suddenly. It, it, I get a sense that it's increasing demographic that qualifies for these programs, or is it more level? Somebody? <laughs> so I, I guess I'll, I'll tackle that one, or I'll give it a shot. In the grant-funded world, um, we do tend to think from year to year. Um, at any given time, the funding is not guaranteed. It could always go away. The administration has actually zeroed out LIHEAP for the past two years. Um, and then Congress has been kind enough to reinstate funding because they understand how important it is to their constituents. Um, but we try not, we don't think ahead too far <laughs> in the grant funded world. Um, when making plans um, for LIHEAP, it's actually one in five. We can serve one in five of those who are eligible. Um, and it's really difficult. So the study that I alluded to when I was, uh, when I was giving my speech, that helps us. We get some depth of knowledge about who's in need and what kind of needs that they have. So that kind of research really helps us to, to identify a number, a dollar figure that we need in order to support the folks that are in the program. But you also have to take into context the current political environment. Um, so all of those things kind of factor together. And we rely on the expertise and the, um, and the thoughts of our membership on where they think we need to go. 
Um, I'll note on, on the weatherization side, the weatherization grants are three years you have to spend out the funds, so there is some uh, you know, longer term planning that goes into it. Um, in terms of need, it really depends on what community you're in. There are some communities where every weatherization agency has long waiting lists, and then there's other communities where that's not the case um, because you know, poverty is uneven across the country and, and these housing conditions are uneven across the country. Um, but there is a lot of latitude at the state level in terms of how you um, meet your state's needs and allocate those fundings to your local providers. So th there is a lot of planning in the sense of goes into of, you know, maybe this weatherization agency w was serving, um, you know, this area, but the population has changed. It's more of a suburban area now, and so there, there is flexibility in your, your state planning. Um, every year, the state grantee has to submit a state plan to the Department of Energy, um, and so uh, there, there's a really opportunity there for states to tailor and respond to changing needs in the state. One thing that the low-income weatherization program allows at the federal level is something, uh, it's like a line item called leveraging. And I, it was something I wasn't really familiar with when I was in New Mexico, but in Washington State, there's been um, an organization called the Energy Project that's been working since the early 1990s to build relationships um, you know, through the CAP network and, uh, and with utilities and kind of partner with community action agencies <laughs> and um, sort of, what they have done is increase the amount of money that's going to the CAPS to provide services and expanded the type of services that they could do. Um, one of the things that was really shocking for me coming uh, up to the Northwest was how much utilities, which I t typically think of as wanting to reduce kilowatt hours, they would allow significant percentages for repairs uh, in order to make those energy efficiency upgrades. And so that is an investment in time, energy, and relationships that's been um, almost 30 years. Uh, and it's, it's that type of collaboration that's going to bring resources together that allows us to serve more people. I'm not sure that there's an expectation that we would be able to serve everyone. Last time I did that math was when the Department of Energy pulled together a group of folks to think about weatherization in terms of a moonshot, mm -hmm. similar to what uh, Governor Inslee thinks about when he wrote mm -hmm. Apollo's Fire. Like, how would we do this if it's a space program? Mm -hmm. And I, I, My recollection is a little foggy, but I think it was $5 billion a year for a few decades would get us to a place where we could solve most of the problem. Uh, discounting the fact that the, this population tends to move around a bit and you could never actually get to zero. Uh, I, I would just want to try to answer that question in terms of basic federal housing programs and assistance. Um, it's really hard, right? So we have, as I just mentioned, only one in four eligible Americans that need some kind of rental assistance to get any. Um, there hasn't been, frankly, political will in Congress to provide anything more than just renewing the existing long-term project-based rental assistance contracts that exist. There has been no new construction that gets allocated a new project-based rental assistance contract in many years. We are just, we have been fighting to just hold on to the level of funding that's needed to continue these long-term contracts that owners have agreed to and to preserve the properties that are currently assisted. And as I noted, even the cost of that is increasing as rents go up. Um, so it's really hard, and I think uh, certainly for the trust, we've been trying to just do as much education as we can, and you know we're excited about working with members of Congress to help people better, and this event is a perfect example of that, to help people better understand what is federal housing assistance, why is it important, who are these people that are being served. We've um, also led a project called Where Will We Live, which provides stories of individual residents, all the different kinds of people who um, have directly benefited from housing assistance, whether it's single mothers or elderly people, people with disabilities, um, people who've had health crises that need um, help, as Katrina so articulately described, that people, things happen in people's lives and they may need, go through a period of time where they need some help, to, so that folks will, in the general public and especially in Congress, will better understand why housing assistance is so important, especially in the last few years when we've seen housing cri prices go up so much and incomes not necessarily keep up with that. Um, and then just in terms of long-term planning with the low-income housing tax credit, again, um, the states do a very meticulous job of trying to evaluate what their needs are and project ahead and I will just circle back to preservation because one thing we know for sure is we cannot afford to lose any assisted housing because the need is growing and growing we are not currently meeting the needs and it's just going to become more so so um, we are really focused on 
preservation of what we already have, which also happens to be the most energy efficient way to provide affordable housing because it's, I think, one half to two thirds the cost to preserve something as it is to build a new building. So, that's right. Thank you. Um, right here. Uh, Thomas Horner with water management in the early 80s, uh, HUD's budget for utility reimbursements, water and sewer costs were less than 6%. I believe last year it was 34%. In 40% of the communities, it's the largest utility expense. Is there any movement to combine anything more than shower heads and aerators into your program? Speaking of needing new windows, um, it's the wind is whistling through the windows here, if you can't hear it. Um, I think it's a great question. There was a pilot program that was authorized during the Obama administration called the Pay for Success program that was trying to incentivize owners to, of privately owned uh, properties with HUD subsidies to, to go further with their and experiment with ways to save um, on energy costs. To be honest, it, I don't believe it's been fully implemented and it was just at the point of implementation when we got a new administration. So um, I think that is, little bit on hold. I know that there have been a lot of discussions with HUD and uh, also on the low-income housing tax credit side to look at how um, in, and a lot of investment especially with properties with low-income housing tax credits in energy efficiency because of the long-term saving benefit. Um, but you know it's it's hard you are dealing with multiple layers of government and I think we have a long way to go. I'll also take a stab at this. Uh, this is an ongoing conversation amongst our membership as well, folks who can't afford water. LIHEAP can't help those folks with that particular utility. What do we do about it? A couple of years ago, we hosted a water summit. Um, in a lot of the cases, our grassroots nonprofits that are members of NUAC, um, they're called fuel funds. They're being asked to come to the table with funding for uh, water affordability. And so they started talking to one another through our organization about how each of them are doing this. And um, we realized that this is a conversation we need to have. What we've seen is that there are, there are some of them putting a Band-Aid on the problem. Um, for example, in Pennsylvania, um, just outside Pittsburgh, the Community Action Agency bought a trailer full of showers and parked it outside of an elementary school so that the children could shower before they come to school because so many in the community had no water. Um, yeah, that works <laughs> on a short-term basis, but how long-term we're preventing those things from happening and helping those folks out has been the topic of conversation that we're having. Where this, you know, energy, water, nexus and where it meets and what we can do about it. Um, so the fuel funds have managed to create sources and resources in some cases for the folks in their neighborhood that are experiencing those kinds of things. Um, but I, I feel like it's, it's a problem that's not, there's no solution for it yet. We're still talking about that solution and trying to figure it out. Halsey Payne with Senator Toon's office. Uh, question for the full panel, just so we get the numbers right. Uh, how many people are eligible for each of your programs versus how many are served? Uh, and then are there any, uh, I've heard uh, rent, climate change, efficiency, and fuel prices uh, as big trends. Are there any other long-term trends that are positive or negative uh, driving your work? I, I can jump in first. Um, so in the United States, there are 28 million plus folks who are eligible for LIHEAP, and we serve just less than 5.9 uh, million. So that's where we're at today. Um, those numbers are from 2018, so they're the most recent that we have available. Uh, fuel prices are the trends that we watch as far as our program goes uh, to determine what the need might be in the future. It's a little bit... Um, it's a little bit like shaking up one of those magic eight balls and seeing what comes up. Uh, it's really hard to predict. We keep an eye on what, what's happening there. In the Northeast, fuel, fuel oil prices are, are very much up. I think they were predicting twice as much as last year, so that's a, a real concern. Natural gas is flat. Um, and then also electricity is up. So we take a look at each of those things and we know where LIHEAP dollars are going to um, go the furthest. 
and we also know when we're going to need more. Um, overall, I would say that, again, with flat funding and prices rising with the same amount of funding, we can't help as many people. So it's, it's really hard to explain that sometimes to the legislature, for example, because they see that our numbers are going down. Why are your numbers going down? Well, because we don't have enough funding to serve all of those people well. Um, but those are the trends that we keep an eye on. Um, I'm going to have to follow up with you about the number that could potentially be served, because I don't have that number off the top of my head. But for project-based rental assistance, it's 1.2 million currently served. And for the low-income housing tax credit, 6.7 million have been served. That, and I would have to double check to see if that is currently or over time. Um, but there is data on the, the number of eligible folks that would meet the income targets, and I'd be happy to follow up with you afterwards. Um, for weatherization, it's, it's kind of, uh, in a similar way, it's difficult to get at the number of potential uh, households in need. And in terms of income eligibility, it's estimated between 30 and 40 million are just income eligible, meaning 200% of poverty level or below. Um, not all of those folks are in inefficient housing, so it, you know, depending upon the housing type, who's in need or not. Um, with Department of Energy funding, the program is weatherizing between 35,000 and 40,000 homes a year. If you factor in the LIHEAP housing, the number is much higher than that. If you go to, from HHS, they're, they've served via LIHEAP probably 65,000 homes in a year. So if you factor in LIHEAP, utilities, DOE, you're probably somewhere near 100,000 homes a year that you're serving. Um, but again, the need is greater than we can currently provide. So I just want to comment a little bit on the trends. Um, the Department of Commerce is fortunate because we have the LIHEAP office, we have the weatherization office, and we have the state energy office all in the same department. So it gives us an opportunity to collaborate and understand the perspectives of the different groups. And some other states may be like that as well, but it's not entirely common. The perspective that you've heard here today is really about serving the individual families and then aggregating that up through the weatherization program and the LIHEAP program. The state energy office through the state energy program funds from the EERE has a much broader, more systemic approach. And so there's having the three groups together creates an interesting dialogue around what's going on in the clean energy transition. Um, how do you meet the immediate needs of low and moderate income customers that are eligible for these programs? And what's going on in that clean energy transition that's outside of the immediate needs that they need to have served? How do we think about the electrification of the grid, uh, the electrification of our transportation system, and figure out how these communities and the community action agencies that serve them can help these folks benefit in a way that's really uh, critically important. Mm -hmm. It's an ongoing discussion. Yep. Um, one more? Yes. Hi, thank you. My name is Liam. I'm with Congresswoman uh, Grace Meg's office. I was wondering, um, I have a question for Ellen Hoffman. I was wondering, when we are building new low-income housing, is there any movement to try and add solar panels or other uh, green energy providing sources so that the energy costs from fuel oil and the uh, increasing rise in that is mitigated and to try to decrease the carbon footprint of low-income housing? Great. Thanks, Liam. I'm glad you asked because the National Housing Trust is trying to do that. We have, a, I think, the largest, I'm looking at my colleague in the back room, I think we have the largest um, solar installation on rental housing in the D.C. area um, here, and happy to talk with you more about that. That's slightly off topic, but um, yes, I mean, I think that, I think that the states that allocate housing credits understand the investments in, I mean, of course, it varies. Every state is different. The perspective on um, energy efficiency and renewable energy obviously is going to vary from state to state, but there are some states that have made a really concerted commitment to energy efficiency in low-income housing tax credit uh, properties and developments. Um, renewable energy, I'd say, is probably on the the new frontier. It, it is very expensive to build affordable housing. Um, as I, me I mentioned earlier about the very high standards that are in there is quite a bit of oversight um, 
for low-income housing tax credit properties at the state level, all of those things. And there is the tax credit syndication. There's a lot of legal costs. It's a very expensive process. Um, and so I, I have not heard about solar panels on housing credit properties. I, that doesn't mean it's not happening. Um, but I think that there, you know, we've been trying, the trust and EFA have been trying to make sure that states understand the investment that they make whether it's in renewable energy or energy efficiency is going to end up paying for itself. Um, the trust has found that by putting solar panels on affordable housing properties, we end up actually generating revenue. Um, we can often defray the costs of uh, utilities so that to really decrease the burden on our residents, but also to enable us to provide more affordability. So, you know, we're definitely trying to educate um, states about that, but. Uh, they're also challenged with the upfront costs of putting it in and have to, you know, really figure out how, because it's, it's a 30-year program and the development costs have, have limits on the most states set development costs for themselves. So if it's going to be more expensive to put like solar panels on, that's a barrier for them. That's right. and, and just to give you some context from Washington State. Um, we administer a state housing trust fund that leverages with our housing finance commission that administers a low income housing tax credit. And again, because of the policy work that the state energy office does, we've been able to partner with our folks that, that do administer the housing trust fund in our agency. And we have what I believe is the most unfortunate acronym for any program in the state that builds on their really strong green building policy. It's called UHE for ultra high energy efficient housing. And the idea is to get the housing as efficient as possible and then there's a consideration of whether you add enough solar to make it net zero. And that's always sort of a cost and size of roof and shading type of discussion. So, um, so we're trying to push those boundaries where it makes sense to do so. I, I have just a, a little something to talk about with, um, with low income solar. Uh, community solar is a big movement and I, I can fully support that. I think that I've seen some projects that are really doing good work in helping to lower energy burden, particularly for all electric homes where we go in and maybe we weatherize and we get it as tight as we can, but their bills are still unaffordable. Adding a community solar element makes a lot of sense and can really help those families. However, I really don't want to see someone install a solar panel on a roof that is falling in. <laughs> it's kind of like feeding caviar to someone who is starving. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I do think it's important to pick the right homes and to be very thoughtful about how we implement solar with low-income communities and make sure that we're actually benefiting them and not um, strapping them with a resource that they then have to, they can't maintain. Yes. I'll, I'll just echo that uh, really quickly. I mean, the Department of Energy has um, put out some guidance or a pathway of how you could incorporate solar into the polarization program. As Katrina said, there are some challenges in the low-income sector there, um, but there is some early success in states like Colorado, Oregon, but I think uh, as, as Alan said, it's going to be really key what are the, the rules and, and the framework in that state. And in Colorado, for example, it's, it's really made possible by the rebates from utilities for solar. So it's, it's a complicated front. Okay. Yes. Uh, let's thank our panel one more time. <laughs> <laughs>